Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session about building performance simulation tools. We are waiting for more people to join us. Um, we will wait for a couple minutes to let all people join us. Um, thank you so much for your participation today. I think we can get started, Amanda. What do you think? Yeah, you can get started. And Bill just joined us as well. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. <clears throat> Hello, Bill. How are you doing? Doing fine. <clears throat> um, I think I was supposed to give a little update. Should I do that quick first, or do you want to? Yes. Do would you please give us an update about code activities and then we will get started sure. okay really quickly um we uh have been very busy um on uh, ai california climate action um on advocacy uh more and more cities are pursuing electric uh, reach codes and uh, most recently alameda and riverside continuing to um, support these efforts and really focusing on Southern California, which is starting to catch up with Northern California, which is really good news. Um, 2022 Title 24 language is firming up and includes um, a lot of the uh, electrical electrification measures that we've been advocating for. Uh, one of the great things about uh, the evolution is that as we've been pushing for the zero code, um, the uh, many elements of the zero code are starting to um, to find their way into uh, Title 24 at a at a more rapid pace, which is very gratifying. Um, AB 1010, which is our um, legislative uh, bill going uh, to require all architects in in California to take uh, five uh, learning credits every two years in zero net carbon mandatory continuing education. Uh, has been rolling through um, the state legislature, much to our delight, uh, and has passed the overwhelmingly passed the state legislature, state assembly, and is now uh, going to be presented to the state senate shortly. So hopefully that will be um, <clears throat> um, adopted. The 2021 Climate Action Webinar Series is in full force, and, uh, and since January, nearly 2,700 architects, design professionals, and engineers These courses are far reaching with attendees joining us from around the world for every session. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, the next uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's on my end, Bill, did we lose you? I can't hear him either. He left, yes. You might have lost Bill in that. Okay. Yeah. So I think um, we could go ahead with the presentation and then once uh, at the end, uh, we'll catch up with Bill again. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for your participation today. We're gonna talk about building performance simulation tools. Um, at AIA Coach, we felt like this topic is much needed to be discussed, and um, uh, I will be your moderator today. I was invited to um, gather uh, an amazing uh, panel of experts uh, to talk about this um, um, topic. Um, so, my name is Ladan Gobad. I am a sustainable design consultant. I'm the founder and CEO, CEO of um, Enerlight Consulting. And my company is focused on advanced building performance simulation for high performance buildings and carbon neutral built environment. I have architectural background as well as PhD in sustainable design and my experience uh, working on over 40 projects 
um, during the past 10 years uh, in both early stage analysis and advanced world building energy modeling has helped me uh, have a really wide perspective about building performance simulation tools, integration of them into the design process, benefits and challenges in this field. Um, as an AIA code member, um, I will discuss this topic with um, our panelists. Mark Yiki from WRNS Studio, uh, Panos Fakos from Arab, and Colin Skinner from Brewa Hapal will join us further to have a dialogue. So today um, we will start by talking about the importance of building performance simulation tools. And I will provide um, an introduction about all the, not all the tools, but most the, the tools that are used mostly um, in the profession. Then I will share some results of the AIA California code survey about the tools that we started about three weeks ago. And uh, then we will have a discussion with our experts. In the discussion, uh, we'll ask our experts to talk about the tools that they use and their design processes, the uh, process that they use for quality check to ensure that the quality um, is uh, checked and assured during their design process. We'll talk about the added value of building performance simulation, and then we'll talk about challenges in this field. Then we'll have an open floor for any question and we'll answer them. So the learning objectives for today's session is to understand the importance of building performance simulation and its role in reducing buildings carbon footprint. Um, and the other, target, the other um, goal is to define the design process that integrates BPS and uh, for the audience to be uh, able to apply it in their projects. Um, the other uh, learning objective is to identify BPS tools, their capabilities, strengths, and limitations. Um, understand the role of quality assurance and quality check, QA, QC in BPS. Describe the added value that BPS brings for the clients and identify challenges in this field. So this is a statement of the problem. We all know that climate change is one of the biggest issues of our days. Burning fossil fuel for energy releases CO2 in the atmosphere, trapping heat, raising the temperature of the planet and causing massive changes to the climate and ecosystem. And we know that buildings are responsible for about 40% of the global CO2 emissions. So what could we do to improve the performance of our built environment and reach zero net energy and carbon neutrality? Building performance simulation is a set of computer generated calculations that help designers compare design options and predict anticipated uh, performance of a building and its systems. It increases the, uh, the ability to make informed decisions to improve energy performance and increase thermal and visual comfort, among all other design issues. Um, we will talk about these tools today. In terms of energy, uh, we'll focus only on operational energy versus embodied energy. We're not going to cover embodied energy. There will be uh, the next round coach roundtable in August that covers the whole um, uh, topic of embodied carbon um, later. And in terms of uh, predictive versus Compliance modeling today, we'll talk about predictive modeling, and we're, we're not going to talk about compliance modeling. Compliance modeling is a model that shows that a minimum level of performance has been achieved in a, in a building. It is not a, a predictive model of a model of energy performance with intention to give feedback to the architect. So today, we're not going to talk about Title 24 compliance modeling. Um, when we look at building performance analysis tools, we can categorize them into two major categories. Uh, so the green bar shows different phases of design from conceptual design, schematic design, until construction administration. So we can put them into two major categories of early stage simulation versus whole building energy modeling. The first category mostly performed by architects, which are Safira, Insight360, Cove Tool, Honeybug, Lady B, Climate Studio. 
And the second category, which are more accurate and advanced energy models or other performance um, analysis tools, mostly focus on energy modeling, which are um, performed by energy analysts or mechanical engineers. So Energy Plus, Equest, Design Builder, ISV, and Open, uh, Open Studio. There are many other tools that um, people use in other firms in the US and around the world, but we are gonna cover mostly these tools today. So I will start with uh, giving you a brief introduction of um, all the tools. And um, Sephora is a, a web-based and also a plugin application for SketchUp and Revit. It works better with SketchUp and it was originally designed for SketchUp, but it also works with Revit. It uses Energy Plus and Radiance as an engine, Energy Plus for energy modeling, Radiance for daylighting. It's really good for providing quick and um, early stage analysis or parametric analysis to see the impact of window to wall ratio and um, R values, orientation um, to um, uh, on the uh, building energy consumption. It is good for daylighting and also um, it does provide some conceptual energy analysis. Unfortunately, it doesn't do detailed HVAC and thermal comfort and CFD. So these are not the capabilities of these tools. The next one is Insight 360, which is a plugin for Revit. Uh, it's free for Revit users and it's an easy plugin to use. Um, it's a cloud-based tool. It uses DOE2 uh, as an engine for performing both energy modeling and daylighting. The quality of daylighting to be performed by Inside 360 is not perfect because it uses the DOE2, which is like the grandfather of Energy Plus. Um, if you want to perform more accurate daylighting in Revit, you have to use LAR, which is Lighting Analysis for Revit. Um, Inside 360 provides conceptual early stage energy modeling, uh, but not detailed HVAC, and thermal comfort, or CFD. It's also good for providing, you know, some alternate um, uh, alter design alternatives and um, you know, check the parametric options at early stage of design. Cove tool is another tool which is um, a web-based tool and also it has plugins for SketchUp, Rhino, and Revit. It uses um, different engines that what we see in most of the other tools, uh, which are uh, mostly um, engines that are used in the Europe. Uh, for daylighting, it uses ray trace rather than uh, radiance, but it is proved and validated to have like about 5% difference with Energy Plus and radiance energy modeling. Um, the benefit of Cove tool is that it provides a really quick um, um, simulation and it's good for early stage modeling. It uh, you know, performs daylighting analysis not glare analysis, and it is also possible to perform conceptual energy modeling. Ladybug and Honeybee tools are uh, plugins for uh, Grasshopper and Rhino. So they work with Rhino, and also uh, the plugin is developed for Revit. Uh, but um, the uh, tool is more capable uh, in Rhino. And also a new web-based tool called Pollination uh, is uh, developed and is available um, for Ladybug tools. The calculation engine is Energy Plus and Radiance. It is good for early stage uh, parametric analysis. It performs daylighting. Uh, you can do glare analysis, conceptual energy modeling. It's not um, intended for detailed HVAC simulation, HVAC modeling, and, and accurate energy modeling for a multiple zone building. Uh, but it, it is really good for conceptual energy analysis. Um, thermal comfort is possible to do um, uh, in, uh, lady, with ladybug tools, and also CFD is possible with an application that is called Butterfly. Um, it's among, still among the ladybug tools. Climate Studio is a development of uh, previous Diva that some of you might be aware of. So Climate Studio uses Diva and Alpha uh, to provide quality um, and um, qualitative and quantitative um, daylighting and electric lighting analysis. It's a plugin um, for Rhino and um, the engine is Radiance and Energy Plus. So it does provide daylighting and glare 
and um, it's good for conceptual energy modeling. Um, it also provides multi-zone thermal analysis uh, compared to DIVA, which was only avail uh, able to do um, single zone analysis. Um, so it's a new development of DIVA with more capabilities. Energy Plus is the uh, Department of Energy, DOE's um, uh, engine for energy modeling in building. Uh, it's a standalone tool. It is um, not very user friendly because it does not have a graphic user interface and um, it's hard to see the geometry, um, but it has been recently uh, used by the uh, calculation engine in other applications. As you see, most of the other applications use Energy Plus as the main engine and main algorithm to run energy modeling. Um, open Studio is developed uh, based on Energy Plus. It's an open source tool uh, supported by DOE, um, and it is uh, both a blogging application for SketchUp, as you see in the picture, and it's also a standalone uh, tool to perform energy modeling. Um, it also, it also you know, does the daylighting with Radiance um, Engine. The next one is Design Builder. Design Builder is a standalone tool. Uh, it's possible to create the geometry in the tool itself, um, but it's also, um, it's, uh, it is also possible to uh, use the geometry from Revit using GBXML, uh, import it in the tool, and uh, create advanced energy modeling in um, uh, Design Builder. It is possible to do a daylighting analysis using Radiance Engine, it's good for conceptual energy modeling as well as detailed HVAC analysis. Thermal comfort is possible. CFD is also available uh, if you purchase a separate module that is specific for CFD analysis. ISVE, very similar to Design Builder, standalone tool. Um, it is uh, possible to create a geometry in the tool. It is also uh, possible to bring the geometry from Revit. It uses, with its, it uses its own um, Apache energy for um, an engine called Apache for energy modeling, which is different from Energy Plus, but still validated and have the same performance. And uh, daylighting is available with a Radiance um, engine. Um, so daylighting, glare, um, conceptual energy modeling, detailed HVAC analysis, thermal comfort, and CFE are all possible to do in IESVE. Um, and um, um, basically, the way that I um, collected um, this information is to start with early stage analysis. As you see, the ones on the top are more kind of quick early stage analysis, and the bottom ones are more advanced um, energy modeling tools. So now I would like to talk to you about the results of the survey that we started about three weeks ago, ask many people to participate and to let us know what they think about the tools. And the survey is still live, so I will share the, um, the link with you uh, to participate if you haven't. And I really want to thank everybody uh, who has responded and participated, um, and um, that uh, meant a lot. Um, so um, there were multiple questions. It was about like a five minute uh, survey. Um, one of the most important part of the survey was talking about the strengths of the tool. So we ask um, people and users of these tools what they think are the main uh, strengths of these tools. Um, so these are the results. I, um, um, I put the results, I mean the tools, in a way that you see the early, more of early stage analysis tools in the top row and more kind of advanced energy modeling and more advanced uh, simulation tools um, at the bottom row. Uh, so, so we have Sapphira, Insight360, Cove Tool, Ladybug Tools, Energy Plus, Equest, Design Builder, ISV, and Open Studio. Uh, one of the items that was asked as the um, strength, as a um, strength of the tools was technical capability. 
technical capabilities are uh, shown in green color. Energy Plus, Design Builder, ISV, and Open Studio, basically the tools on the bottom row, which are more advanced except for Equest, are known very uh, good for their technical capabilities. Equest um, is, um, it's very easy to use, and I will talk about that, but the tool hasn't been developed since its original um, uh, development, and it doesn't have, um, uh, it, it has not had a lot of updates or revisions, so it's, um, uh, I think that's the reason that people do not think the capabilities are um, advanced, um, and it just uses the DOE2 engine, which is, you know, an um, old engine. Um, in terms of the early stage analysis, Ladybug tools um, ranked higher than the others, and I think it's because of the capability of tool um, to bring in uh, very different, various um, environmental um, uh, analysis together, and um, it's very flexible. The um, next question was about beam interoperability. So it's shown in blue color. Inside 360 Cove tool and then ISV rank higher. So basically the tools that have the plugin for Revit, Rhino, SketchUp, these are those tools ranked higher because having the plugin in the 3D geometry modeling would, uh, would be much easier for uh, users to, you know, create the um, geometry and see the um, building performance uh, results. Um, among the second group of more kind of advanced tools, ISV ranked higher, and it's because um, uh, ISV is really good in terms of, you know, um, uh, importing the GBXML uh, model and also for, it works well with um, Excel, so you can import and export uh, data. Um, yellow color um, is when we ask about if the tools are easy to learn. Um, sorry about the noise. Um, so we asked if the tools are easy to learn. Um, and the tools that are easy to learn are um, Equest, Safira, and Inside360 based on their responses. Um, um, Safari, um, and these are more kind of, you know, uh, the um, early stage analysis tools. Although a Ladybug tool is not known to be very easy to learn, and it's because of the uh, you know, the background uh, knowledge about uh, Grasshopper and uh, Rhino that is needed to use the tool. Light blue is uh, time efficiency. And so we asked uh, which of the tools um, create really uh, fast results. Safara, Cotool, and Equus um, ranked higher than the rest. Um, our uh, orange color was about problem solving. How is it easy to do problem solving and find um, any issues and solve any issues with the uh, tools? Um, Design Builder, IES, and Equest rank higher. And so basically the uh, kind of black box tools, the early stage analysis tools are kind of black box tools where you do not see the algorithms, you cannot change all the inputs. Uh, so it's not easy to do problem solving versus the advanced tools. It's much easier to do problem solving because you can uh, manipulate all the inputs, see all the inputs, and see the algorithm. Um, purple color is graphic outputs, um, um, and Ladybug tools and IES ranked higher. And uh, in Ladybug, it's really easy to um, adjust the graphics and create the graphics based on your needs. Uh, ISV also um, creates good graphs. Um, and pink color is having low to no cost. The tools that are free, which are Energy Plus, Equest, and Open Studio, ranked higher. Brown color um, is uh, technical support. So we asked them if they're happy and satisfied with the technical support from the development uh, team that they receive. Uh, Design Builder and IES ranked higher, and I think that really makes sense because they have a really good support team. Cove Tool also provides an instant messaging with the development team. So if you have a question, you can ask the questions instantly and get your response, which is, uh, which is really awesome. Um, in terms of limitations, um, 
of technical, in terms of technical capability, eQuest, because of not having any further development from the original tool, um, I think that ranks higher as a tool that needs further in development. Um, Ladybug Tools and Energy Plus are, uh, reported to have a steep learning curve. So um, learning curve in um, shown in uh, yellow color. It's um, it takes more time to get um, uh, to get used to Grasshopper and learn how to work with Ladybug tools and also Energy Plus. Uh, it is um, it's not an easy tool to learn and use. Uh, in terms of time efficiency, which is in blue color, um, um, light blue color. Um, well, what we see in the responses is um, the more advanced tools uh, ranks lower, which makes sense because they take more time to create the advanced model and it takes more time to run the simulation in the advanced tools compared to the um, early stage tools that are intended to create really fast results. And um, at the end, technical support uh, needs to get improved in eQuest. Basically, it doesn't have any technical support currently. And Open Studio also ranked um, high, uh, meaning that it needs more technical support. In terms of the benefits of using the tools, um, meeting their project goals for energy reduction ranked higher. Um, climate change mitigation and to reduce carbon emissions uh, ranked uh, second. And also people thought that um, easier compliance with California Energy Code is another reason to use the DPS tools and also um, reduce operational costs for the building owner. I personally thought that the reduced operational cost for the client is a, is a big motivation to use the tools, but apparently um, it's not one of the highest. Um, reasons. The other things that people reported are benefit, um, uh, are um, architecture 2030 reporting for AIA 2030 commitment. So they use the tools um, to provide that report and um, to base design decisions on function, stat uh, statics, and being able to factor in and show the client energy implications. This is another response that we got. Uh, greater insight uh, before engineers are brought on board is another comment uh, from an architect saying that it's really good to have the um, EPS early stage simulation tools to uh, create the uh, to make uh, some decisions before engineers are involved. Uh, obstacles and challenges not having enough experts um, in the organization was ranked higher than the other. Um, elements, lack of knowledge about how to integrate these tools into the design process. Uh, one uh, person mentioned that um, the reason uh, for not using these tools is not knowing how much time it takes and if the project can afford to perform these simulations. Um, the other thing is cost of BPS tools. And uh, the other items that ranked uh, lower than the other ones, cost of EPS uh, consultant services, lack of trust in tools output, and lack of interest and importance for the client. Um, so the one which ranked higher was uh, not having enough experts um, to perform this analysis. So uh, I would like to have um, our great panelists to start this discussion about what tools they use in their firms and uh, what design process they have and uh, talk about what they see as uh, the added value that uh, DPS brings uh, for their projects and to their clients. And I will start with uh, Mark. So Mark is a creative and thoughtful architect who brings an element of play to his work. He balances practical application with cultural understanding and environmental awareness, approaching architecture Victor as a tool to connect people to physical space and ecological place. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from Penn State. His senior thesis reimagined the Pacific Coast Highway as a national park, blurring the lines between architecture, ecotourism, and preservation. Mark lives in San Francisco and focuses on building performance simulation at WRNN Studio. 
Thanks a lot, Anne. Um, I, I will be mostly speaking uh, from the perspective of the architect. Our, our other two panelists uh, will, will obviously be filling in more in the detailed perspective, um, but I figured I would start with uh, the tools and, and processes that we use at WRNS uh, just as a basis. Um, so at WRNS, these, these are some of the main tenants that we hold. Um, and, and they aren't just sustainable tenants, but rather design tenants. Um, so we, we approach every project as a sustainable project. Um, and this means that there's a story in every building about how to be sustainable and how to uh, approach the design sustainably. So this isn't a, um, an added bonus or feature to a design, but rather um, an integration of the design. And that, that really has um, shown itself in a lot of our work. And I think, I think we'll be able to, to talk about that in a bit more. Um, and then we also focus a lot on transparency, both with um, our, our clients about how buildings should be built. You know, our, our uh, beliefs, our, our transparency to them, I think has made um, a lot of positive impact. And um, we, we try to be transparent with ourselves about how to get better and how to improve and, and where that can happen in the design. Um, one of the first tools that we use on the next slide is um, Insight. So our, um, our firm has been working with Insight for maybe two or three years now um, and trying to find the best ways to use it. Um, since we are a very Revit heavy firm, this, this tool is, is pretty uh, seamless for us. Um, you can see here, this is some annual daylight exposure that we did um, to compare different spaces and, and how, uh, how much light we can get into a relatively small building. Um, the other tool that we use is um, the bugs. So we, we affectionately call that ladybug, honeybee, and uh, grasshopper in total. Um, and these tools really help us, I think, in the early stages to um, inform design decisions in massing, inform uh, programmatic elements, circulation elements. Um, a lot of the different uh, approaches to our, our site can, can really be driven by um, what the model can, can inform us about. Um, and then the next slide. Um, so this, this is just a little diagram that I put together uh, a few years ago, just talking about uh, the flowing river that, that we follow. Um, so design has many facets and many different tributaries that we follow our way through. Um, and this is just meant to sort of graphically communicate the, the viable paths that can be taken. Um, on the right side of the river, you'll see a lot more of the, the Rhino tools and on the left side, um, the, the Revit tools, and that's, that's mostly Insight. Um, but really along this process, our, our thought is that even at concept design, um, doing a quick study in Insight can be super informative to um, preliminary conversations with the client. They can uh, facilitate questions about operation hours, um, mechanical systems, PVs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the quick tool use on the Revit side can really inform, like I was saying, uh, programmatic layout or um, early stage processes of, of where and how and um, what, what can happen with light wells, courtyards, um, penetrations, all that kind of stuff. And then as you, as you work your way down the path, um, you know, I, I personally see this as a way to uh, basically create a set of, of bridging, um, maybe not documents, but I, ideals. So the more that we understand um, the early stage uh, design intent with the energy model, the easier it is to uh, communicate that to an energy modeler. So someone that we'd work with um, down the road in design development or schematic design. And, and really um, by informing ourselves early, being able to um, inform uh, an energy modeling consultant or a uh, HVAC consultant um, about our intents and, and really uh, drive home the, the design goals from the beginning. Next slide. Um, and this doesn't have to be something that's uh, very pretty or very perfect. Um, these are just some snapshots from a few miscellaneous studies that we've done in the past month or two. Um, I've listed them below, but there, there's um, a reskin project that we had a client ask us, uh, hey, we want to reskin a building that we already have. Can you help us understand what that would mean? 
Um, we've had a, a study of a, a green wall at the uh, Silicon Valley headquarters, which is the um, winner of one of the, the COAT awards. Um, and then we've also used daylighting and, and shadow studies to inform uh, massings in downtown San Jose, um, understand uh, the heating element of, of the sun in, in like a really small kiosk, and then uh, compare EUIs from, from baseline to um, different operating hours to see how uh, a cultural change from a client perspective could have big uh, climate change implications. And so asking those questions early could, could mean a lot down the road. Um, and the next slide. So uh, quality check is, is a bit ambiguous to us, but I, I'll, I'll bring uh, some, some different ideas to it. Um, these, these are four steps that I, I really have come up with. I, I wouldn't say that we have a, a prescriptive method at WNS, but I think that um, over the years, this has really become the standard. Um, a lot of this uh, starts really with anecdotal um, experience and uh, combining it with learning of, of tools uh, creates design intent. And for us, that means, um, you know, how can we use a tool that's out there to inform ourselves about um, the, the design decisions we're making? And then uh, using that to develop an approach really means that we're uh, taking tools and uh, asking questions of them. You know, I don't think that any tool that we've had is, has been infallible. Um, it's always asked more of and, and asked why and where and how. Um, but we, we take that information forward and I think it helps us to uh, communicate with each other, not just inside the firm, but uh, with our clients and with our consultants. Um, and then we like to also, you know, take that into the real experience. So uh, Microsoft Silicon Valley right here in the photo. Um, I think we'll have a lot of lessons to, to teach us. And I think that um, it has taught us a lot along the way. So um, taking experience that we've, we've had and sharing it out with the office has been um, a huge part of the, the pandemic for us. We've had um, share outs every Wednesdays about you know, every single project in the studio has had it, has its uh, spotlight and we get to share sustainable stories and um, client experiences and, and all these things that start to inform uh, a, a better informed architect and a better like question asking person. Um, and then we, we take those forward and, and adopt them in the future. And so it's, it's really just a, a feedback loop, hopefully going into the, to the next stage of, of the next project. Next slide. Um, so the, the added value and challenge is a, is a really interesting one. The, um, the challenges are, are, I think, uh, an interesting place to start. For, for my perspective, at least, the, the thing that I always think about is that buildings are inherited, and so are cities. And, and the idea that um, the work done now is not finite, it, it continues. And so, um, you know, a client may ask, why, why do we care about the, the solar quality performance of this lobby? And then, uh, you know, the short answer for me has always been, well, it's not just your lobby, like it's, it's everyone's lobby, or it could be someone else's lobby in the future. And so um, being generous about how we approach this plot problem really has implications across, you know, many, many years, not just the ones that were here. Um, and I think that for building energy modeling specifically, um, it's really about teaching value to the client and really uh, conveying to them how impactful this kind of stuff is. And that could be on a cost savings perspective. So this, this photo is from a study we did for a biotech lab that was trying to um, see what glass in their lobby would, would be most cost effective. Um, but we wanted to factor in the, the cost of heating and cooling the space. And so we did a little bit of an exposure study to see um, each of these is, is a different um, glass type. And so you can see that the impact that a different glass type has on, on a space and, and the, um, the implications of that are, are rather large. Um, and then I think it's also about learning value. So, uh, you know, we want to learn as architects what, what can be the most impactful part of the design and, and learning that uh, can be a challenge. It's, it's, it's tough to find out which tool what time, what place, how long. Um, those are all things that I, I think are um, 
learning opportunities in the future. Um, and then the next slide, I think we'll cover possibilities in the future that I see. Um, just briefly, I think that we, we're heading down a, uh, a converging road into an all-in-one world. So I, I see a lot of possibilities with um, the integration uh, between Rhino and Revit uh, is huge. So there's a, there's a tool plugin for Revit that, that can allow you to control Rhino, um, which can then allow you to control Grasshopper, which means that uh, a study that you do in Honeybee or Ladybug early on could be used um, all the way through CDs if, if it had enough uh, of an understanding or enough knowledge to get there. Um, so really all in one, one stop shopping. Um, I see that as, as a huge uh, potential. And then um, this, this other screenshot is from a, a talk I went to maybe a year or two ago about the, uh, the ever reducing cost of simulation and how, how cheap it really is getting. And I see a lot of um, artificial intelligence murmuring um, or cloud uh, processing where an energy model or even a daylight simulation could be um, done for pennies on the dollar and, and done rather fast. And so I think that um, we're, we're approaching an era where this, this will become the norm rather than the exception. I think that's all I've got. So Don, you're on mute. mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mark. I was thanking mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Mark, so much for your great presentation. And next we have Panos Balkos from Arab. Panos is a project manager and senior building physics engineer in Arabs and San Francisco Energy and Sustainability Group. He performs building performance simulations, assesses building design options, and delivers sustainability services that span from a building to a campus level. Panos also serves on the IBIPSA USA board, a nonprofit organization that focuses on the advancements of the energy simulation processes for better and energy efficient building design. Over the past 10 years, Panos has been a key proponent and driver for sustainable design solutions across a broad building portfolio. Welcome, Panos. Thank you, Ladan. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. So our approach to energy modeling always involves answering some initial questions. Answering these questions will help the design team identify the scope, the project goals, and the purpose of the model, really. The simple approach, uh, this simple approach will set you up for success and ensure that you don't create a model more complicated and time intensive than what you really need. Next slide, please. So you might know that already, and I cannot stress this enough, but the energy modeling process has to be very collaborative among the design team members. We have numerous examples of projects that their success was highly depending on open communication. This communication needs to be established as early as possible so that the required information will start flowing in. And even though the level of effort to build a model might not seem high at the beginning of the project, Collaboration is crucial to ensure proper outcomes, especially if the BEM tasks will be repeated in other design phases. AIA's Guide to Building Performance is a great and recent document that highlights the different methodologies, various tools, benefits, and key aspects of modeling. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as designers, we want to uh, have accurate answers, precise data, so that we can use them to set performance goals as early as possible. At the same time, we have to recognize that energy models get more and more accurate as they are being fed with more information. This graph basically illustrates a best practice we follow for a proper output level of detail. For example, in higher uncertainty phases, let's say during schematic design, the output of a model should be communicated as a range or a percentage. At this stage, an exact UI number might not seem reasonable since it will fluctuate as the design progresses, where a percentage of UI reduction could be more relevant for decision-making purposes. As the uncertainty of the design becomes lower, let's say in the CDs, and more information is available at that time, a more precise output should be communicated to the design team. Well, as you understand, visualization of outputs is key. And with that, I want to make a plug of BIPSA's project Stagio, which is a library of graphics 
that focus on promoting better ways to communicate modeling outputs. You can find that at the resource in slides. Next slide, please. We do offer a variety of energy modeling services, and we use a plethora of software packages for that. For example, in early stage building design or for master planning projects, where rapid iteration, optimization, and fast decision making is key, a workflow that we follow is the use of the insect suite of Grasshopper, as Mark mentioned, uh, in conjunction with a Python package called Epi to generate thousands of iterations. Those are often then sent to Amazon Web Services for simulation over an Energy Plus platform. And then we analyze the results with a tool called Design Explorer. This is a similar workflow to Collins, who will be describing this in greater detail later. For detailed building level modeling, lead models, code compliance other than Title 24 and incentives, we, we would use IES. For Title 24 compliance, we will have to use CBECOM, uh, where daylight modeling, we found that Radiance and ha with Honeybee is the most cost effective. Some packages are either free or low cost, which makes them affordable for beginners. Others offer higher complexity in building systems or can be used for model calibration digital twins. As Ladan mentioned, each software package has its strength, so I'll encourage everyone to try and use them wise. For additional resources, there is the IA, AIA's Guide to Integrate Energy Modeling in the Design Process, and also RMI's BEM for Owners and Manager are also can be found in, this, in the resourcing slides. Beyond the software packages, and depending on the application of the type of the project, we also use additional tools that we have developed in-house. The WeatherShift tool, for example, uses data for global climate change modeling to produce weather files adjusted for changing climate conditions. These weather files can then be used in building energy model to predict changes in mechanical system capacity or cost of operations in the near future. Another tool related to comfort modeling is the advanced comfort tool that is used to simulate human response and predict the thermal comfort under transient environmental conditions. Next slide, please. So QAQC energy modeling is essential. Uh, and th this, this goes beyond ARUC. Many professionals think that energy modeling is a black box and we have to recognize that it has a steep learning curve for someone starting from scratch. However, it becomes less of a rocket science once proper QAQC protocols are followed. We have a pretty robust QAQC process that has been developed over the years. It is nothing too sophisticated other than a list of items where the modeler has to go through and ensure proper attention is paid. That's it, really. Next slide, please. As an example of common and, and very simple error we find during QAQC process is the weather file selection. I am currently located in Walnut Creek, so if I had to choose a weather file for my home building, I would immediately go to one with the closest proximity. Buchanan Field in this case, which is located in location A. But Buchanan Field is close to the bay, while Walnut Creek is much further inland. So temperature and humidity might differ, differ significantly. And perhaps Livermore, which is located in, in location F, in this case is a, a little bit more of a representative climate for Walnut Creek. So being transparent by stating all inputs in energy modeling is crucial for the modeling results to start like making sense. Next slide, please. So this diagram is an attempt of one of my colleagues to capture how our industry works in various development scales, see the vertical axis, and different design phases, see the horizontal axis. As planners and designers, we spend most of our time in the planning and design phase within the blue boundary, but you will notice energy modeling really encompasses everything beyond that boundary. Next slide, please. In ARUP, we perform modeling in all scales and phases. For example, modeling in the policy phase is where EUIs for typical buildings are established based on the energy code. This becomes a point of comparison for the building models that architects focus on. On the other side of the spectrum, a developer might have operational data for their existing building portfolio. Therefore, benchmarking a new development across their existing buildings to ensure similar or better performance might seem necessary. At last, a building portfolio client 
might be looking at a series of energy conservation measures in existing buildings. At that point, a calibrated model will be valuable to various operation improvements. Next slide, please. In regards to future development, we see many challenges, but also a lot of potential. A few examples of emerging and complex technologies that are currently very difficult to model is heat recovery chillers, thermal energy storage tanks, electric vehicle charging and battery storage. We also recognize that the industry and codes are slowly moving towards a carbon emissions metric with building electrification. It seems that the building performance will soon be evaluated based on time varying grid emissions as well. We also have to recognize that even though the speed of simulation gets better, the model complexity does too. So it eventually becomes a data problem that perhaps could be solved with cloud simulations. Software interoperability has been a challenge for a long time. It would be nice to overcome that obstacle at some point and have one model for multiple purposes, but maybe this is too optimistic for now. At last, and realizing that I don't have a perfect answer for this, I would like to leave you with something aspirational. In an ideal world scenario, wouldn't it be more appropriate to comply with performance targets after the building is built and operating? Well, that concept of outcome-based compliance has been in discussions for quite some time. This is not to eliminate energy modeling from the design, but rather expand it in the operations phase enabled by digital twins. We are in the pilot phase where the, we explore the capability of backfeeding the energy model with light, live performance data so it will inform the building's operation and improve the occupant's comfort. Exciting times ahead. Back to you, Ladan. Thank you so much, Panos, for your great presentation. And I think that's very important. If uh, we want to evaluate buildings based on their performance, then we try to create the best energy models to match their performance and be more you know, accurate. Um, so next, I have Colin Skinner from Bureau Happel. Colin is a senior energy modeler on the Los Angeles Sustainability and Physics team and is focused on delivering analysis on energy conservation measures, including passive and active design, facade optimization, and control strategies. Colin also has expertise in compliance modeling for LEED and California Energy Code. He is driven by complex building physics problems and aims to provide valuable input and sustainable design features by incorporating in-depth computational analysis. Colin, welcome and thank you. Thanks, great introduction. Um, so I just want to jump straight into tools and design process and, and just showing an example design timeline for energy modeling in general. Um, this is what I would call an idealistic view of how to use an energy modeling software package if you look at energy modeling in a vacuum. Um, we understand that projects don't exist within a vacuum, but um, you know, idealistically, you want to front load as much of the effort as possible without um, going into as much complexity as possible. So in the concept of schematic design, starting with an easy shoebox model, a simple massing model, to um, better inform the, the ranges of information and get down, to, you know, try to whittle down to the performance targets that we would like to see within the building. And as the, the design progresses, we do, you know, it's a design development and construction documentation, we start uh, incorporating what we would call a five zone massing model where you have your foreign perimeter spaces um, and you're starting to look more like the actual building itself rather than just sort of a generic mass a blob until you then update it for detailed building geometry so that you're, you're trying to get as accurate as possible to the design intent. Um, it does show the detailed HVAC modeling towards the end. Uh, like I said, this is, would be ideal within a vacuum. Um, but you know, a lot of this process gets mixed and matched. I've done concept, I've done shoebox modeling in, in CDs to answer a simple question, and I do detailed HVAC modeling sometimes in concept and schematic design where we're doing a significant amount of optioneering for different types of HVAC systems that are potential on the project. So this is not a hard, fast rule, but this is sort of the, the way that BH approaches the, the, the project, um, the project scale when it comes to energy modeling in general. Um, next slide, please. 
So leaning into the capabilities, uh, I would call these two our daily drivers. We use Honeybee and Ladybug tools as our, what I would call a rough in analysis, you know, getting those ranges as part of, um, put very well in terms of, of what's appropriate at an earlier design phase for output. Um, and we do shift gears over to IES when we want to do more detailed optioneering and, and building physics analysis as well. Um, I call these our daily drivers because uh, at BH we understand that not every tool is appropriate for every problem. So we do like to uh, be as flexible as possible. We ask ourselves the question whether or not the tool, you know, we ask ourselves based on the question that we're being asked, what is the appropriate tool to analyze that um, problem? Um, and then there's at the bottom is an example of a parallel coordinate chart, which should be more of the outputs that we're getting from the rough end analysis where we can do some quick parametric analysis and able to filter through different input options, which is what the, is being shown on the left side. And then the, the right side is showing your, your performance outcomes and being able to filter for what is your best performing system there. Um, on to the next slide, please. I think we'd be into future developments. I try to keep this as broad as possible. Um, future developments on software in general, not even just for energy modeling, um, because there's a lot of collaboration, you know, better interoperability between all software is really important, um, not just between, say, Revit and IS, but also between, um, you know, ETABs for our structures teams or Excel, if someone's doing an Excel calc that they want to pull information out of Revit really quickly. Easily, you know, there's there's more to it than just what we would call classic and top interoperability in terms of you know taking a Revit model and putting it into something like IES or Energy Plus. Um, and then on the right side, showing a concept about higher accuracy and higher precision. I think um, the tools are developed. You know, the, the 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 baseline building physics that's operating within these engines. Um, you know, the, the precision that's there is, is based on pretty sound building physics. And so the addition of um, uh, new emerging technologies as part of the simulation is important to increase both the precision and the accuracy within the tools. I do want to point out that the energy modeling ideal is realistically, you know, in a very ideal world, we'd be in this bottom right corner with high accuracy and high precision. However, that's not always appropriate. And if you try to go for the bottom right, you may end up in the top, top right instead, in which case you are highly precise in a very low accurate solution, which means that you're actually misinforming the, the project completely. Um, so ideally, we like to shoot for the bottom left that, you know, we want to be able to inform the decision and um, the decision making that's happening with a good range of results that are hitting onto the points that um, make the most impact. Um, can you, next slide please. Cool, so okay, so quality check. So quality check is something that's pretty difficult to do um, for energy modeling. It can be very tedious. It's a lot of inputs, a lot of outputs. Um, What's really useful is that if we are working on a lead project, there's the minimum performance energy calculator or minimum energy performance calculator, um, which is just a collation of most of your inputs and a lot of your outputs for in terms of uh, energy credits. Um, we like to utilize this as a QAQC point. It's not the only thing that we do use. We also do work on projects that aren't going for the lead credits. So it's not, uh, we don't necessarily have this running for every project. Um, what we do for every project is we have an internal workbook that we use, very similar to the one that Panos is describing for Eric, that they've developed internally. We've also developed something internally to document all of our input assumptions, our design intent, and even our modeling techniques. You know, if there's something unique or something challenging in terms of how something needs to be modeled, we'll uh, document it within this internal workbook. And it also has post-processing of results because Sometimes not any, not every energy modeling software can model everything you need. So, so post-processing of some results may still be required and we collate that together in an internal workflow. And then uh, at BH, we also are really pushing this idea of using a transdisciplinary model and its uses for QAQC are extremely uh, powerful. 
uh, what we call what we mean by a transdisciplinary model is a model that can be used by the multiple disciplines that are working on the project, whether that's the building physics team with me, or our facades team, our MAP team, structures team, even too. Um, having this type of model is really useful for QA QC. Um, it's also really useful to uh, enable much faster transfer of information and design intent between the analysts like myself and the design team who are actually coming up with the design. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I actually have an example of what one of these transdisciplinary models look like, where the full model is exposed on the left side. And depending on what information you actually need out of it, um, you can then see that there's an MEP of facades, building physics, and structures model all within the same one. And that enables faster transfer of information. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, I think we're going into added value. Great. Okay, so the building performance software added values is kind of twofold, right? It's the software itself is, is enabling you to do these calculations um, to better inform design. So it's linking design functionality and elements to key performance indicators, um, while also being able to simultaneously engage stakeholders and balance any dependencies between those design elements and the functionality that's that's coming out of those. Um, and what that enables us to do as an analyst is, and as a design team is to be able to create better informed decisions for, and pathways for project goals and building code compliance. Um, kind of links into um, the survey results which were showing that meeting your project goals is the number one reason to, to use a building energy software um, uh, to, to model and make sure that you're actually hitting that. Um, and, I, and we agree with that. I think that that's one of the main benefits of the software itself. However, it goes a little bit deeper than that, where um, it's not just the software that's being paid for, right? It's also the analyst who's doing it. Um, and I would say that the analyst is the person who's demystifying the input and output process of the simulation. Um, they're removing that black box feel from the actual model itself because it does take a, a level of understanding to be able to interpret the results that you get out of a model itself, which takes practice, right? Um, but it's something that just, you, it requires repetition, repetition legitimizes. So um, being able to review all of those inputs, be able to, to, to make sense of all the outputs and, and what that means in terms of the project itself and linking it back to the real world. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so jumping into challenges and this links back to the um, uh, previous slide as well that the main challenge BHC is uh, moving forward is interoperability between not only Ben and BIM, but also showing here that it's even an interoperability problem between people and the way that information is discussed and the way that results are interpreted. Um, and we think that uh, um, getting everyone on the same page in the way that we talk about these buildings and the energy modeling is, is extremely important. And, one of the ways that we can do this is actually by um, increasing interoperability between our tools. Because once you increase that interoperability, you increase the transfer of information, you see how information used from one team is linked to another team, and you're e it's easier to interpret results based on that. Um, as a quick plug um, for an open source tool that BH uses for interoperability, to increase our interoperability, we use an open source tool called Buildings and Habitats Object Model, um, which I believe will be linked into on the resource page later on. Um, and essentially that's an object model that's being able to adapt the software, uh, one software to another, um, which is extremely useful. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I think the next few slides are sort of just showing what all of this integration looks like from an early modeling standpoint. Um, I'll kind of let this run and speak over it a little bit, but essentially this is showing, uh, obviously not a real building, but a, a tester model for some of the workflows and processes that we've been working through about being able to create um, real-time updates to models, which is extremely useful to, to sit with the design team and whatnot. Um, 
and show them what impacts their decisions are making on certain areas of the building. Um, this is showing, the, the previous slide was showing an integration of you know, loads within the building. This is showing um, daylighting on floor plates. And this is a tool that you could even give to a client and have them be able to play around with it and, and get a better understanding of what their different design options are actually doing for, in that example, is data lighting. And in this example, again, it's showing how uh, envelope values are impacting your load and your energy. And if we go to the last slide, um, this is again showing the integration between a daylighting model and you can also see structural elements. So these structural elements were brought in directly from the transdisciplinary model where they have their structural elements set up and able to link together things that would actually impact your lighting results directly into the model without any extra effort because someone's already modeled it. So you're able to just link it straight in. Um, I think that's it for my slides. Um, if we go to the next one. Yeah, okay. Not unmuted, so that, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. So in the next slides, I would like to uh, share some resources with you that we discussed. Uh, the first one is um, IVEXA USA, International Building Performance Simulation uh, Project Statio that um, um, Panos told us. It's a great resource. And it talks about actually standard um, um, 209. And also it provides a, a modeler map where you can find um, other build, um, energy modelers on a map and you know, have access to them. Um, and there is also another um, resource, which is Building Energy Software Tools Directory, uh, which shows you all the different um, tools that uh, and we didn't discuss today, so it's a great resource to uh, learn more about uh, different and various tools. I also wanted to um, let you know about AIA California Code August Roundtable about embodied carbon, so stay tuned about that. It's going to be really interesting. Um, research papers and white papers, I know that there are so many papers written about these topics, but uh, I wrote a paper in 2018 um, called Daylighting and Energy Simulation Workflow that I will share discussing about uh, workflow in uh, four different um, simulation tools. Um, and um, there are other um, also white papers and research papers available. Uh, so uh, talking about the points that Colin made about um, reaching high accuracy, but um, even with low precision, but high accuracy and spending less time to be more um, time efficient and um, cost efficient, I think these benchmarking tools help a lot. So with these benchmarking tools, you can um, understand how much is the EUI or um, uh, how much is the uh, baseline building's energy consumption uh, without spending a lot of time. So these are CBEX database, Energy Star Target Finder, Architecture 2030 Zero Tool and Zero Code Tool and DOE Building Performance Database. These are really amazing. And the other tools that um, our panelists shared, um, like Weather uh, Shift, um, uh, Arabs Advanced Comfort Tool, and uh, the other tools that we discussed. So we will share the link to access all these open source uh, tools um, in a follow-up email to all the participants. Uh, I want to thank all the uh, panelists again. Um, I have included my email address here. So if you have any questions, um, I think we can um, uh, have an open floor to address questions and answers. Uh, but if you have any further um, questions, just let me know. So there's quite well a few questions in the chat. Bill, do you want to start? Because I know you had a few. Uh, well, I, I'm fine having the uh, presenters scan the questions and decide what they think is most important. I don't want to dominate. Sounds good. 
Don, are you able to see the chat box? If you stop sharing your screen and then click over to the chat, you can see all of the questions that are in there. Yes, I can see the chat box here. Uh, so let me start yeah. from the beginning. Yeah, mommy. Um, so I can see Bill's mm, mm, notes. Mm, 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 mm. Sorry, I have my kid here. <laughs> okay, let me see what I have. Um, so Bill is saying my understanding is that Energy Plus can model a wider range of systems such as radiant heating cooling than DOE2. Of course, it depends on how the interface we it inside 360 or eQuest utilizes the capabilities of the underlying calculation engine. Can you speak to this and how much it matters for the two large categories of tools you have established? Um, so in terms of, I think that's a really good question. And um, I believe for the early stage analysis where the purpose is to understand how much is uh, the EUI of a baseline and um, to start the projects during the schematic design, it's just, um, it's just important to have an idea of um, how much, uh, you know, that EUI could be in general. It's not that important to, um, to dive deep into the details. Um, however, sometimes those information, if they're not accurate, they can create uh, some variances. Like, uh, for example, if the inputs from all the disciplines are not accurate, like if you do not, um, uh, if you do not account for, for example, the something that I see most of the time missing, like the equipment load in the building. Um, if you don't account for them and miss them, uh, then it will, um, you know, create a larger impact during the, uh, the other phases of uh, design. Uh, so it could change an EUI of a building from like EUI of uh, 20 to uh, like 30. So if you take account for um, those huge large loads like um, equipment loads that are not changed and could not be changed in the building, um, um, it is, you know, you're gonna, um, you're gonna miss some options. Um, the other things that I see are these uh, comparative slides. Um, all, um, are these comparative slides are all very good information. Thank you. Are they available to us as PDF later? Yes, they will be available um, to you. I have to do some final revisions and I have to add some responses. Uh, we had about 50 responses uh, in and uh, beyond California. So I have to do some analysis and I'm planning to uh, write a paper about all the results that I have uh, received. Is it correct that Safari is low, no cost? It's not true. It costs. It is. It has a, um, uh, I think, ten day free trial for AIA members. It has a thirty day free trial. Um, it's showing a hundred percent. I have to double check. Um, you know, sometimes uh, from the respondents, it means that it has a low cost compared to uh, more costly um, tools, but um, Having no cost is um, not correct. It definitely costs money. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you, Dave. Safari is and free, but it's relatively inexpensive. This presentation is being recorded and I okay. can... Um, so the other question, what are the advantages of ISV, which uses the prior, um, proprietary Apache calculation engine over energy plus tools? Many top engineering firms opt for ISV. Is it interface range of camera? I can speak into that because um, I started using ISV um, uh, for about uh, the past uh, three years, I used to have energy 
plus base uh, tools. Uh, the main benefit of ISVE is um, its interoperability with Excel. So having Excel uh, by your hand is so easy to have all the inputs categorized and changed as the design changes during the design phase, uh, you know, advances uh, during the uh, design phases. So it makes it really easy to create, to um, import all the inputs and the graphics are uh, really good. Uh, the other thing is the reports that it provides are really very inclusive. So uh, with one simulation, you will have um, uh, hourly results where you can just dig into every hour of performance of the building to find out uh, what were the problems. Um, the other things that, so in terms of interoperability, uh, it's really good. And I have to mention that Design Builder new version, version seven, uh, has added this capability of um, um, moving back and forth uh, with Excel and with Energy Plus. So uh, I think with the new um, version of Design Builder, which is another similar tool, uh, we'll see more benefits there too. Um, can you give an example of a recent project that is completed? Describe how accurately the modeling aligned with actual energy consumption. I can talk about one of the zero net energy schools that I worked on. Um, um, we designed this net zero energy school in Durham uh, in um, uh, Oregon. And the building was constructed and then um, analyzed. Um, the differences, the EUI wasn't a lot different. The actual building had more EUI, and I think that makes sense because we usually um, ignore and um, um, do not include all the energy consumptions in the building. Um, the building had more energy consumption because it was used uh, for more um, hours, for more events, and um, it was something that was not an, a correct input in the building. So it was used during the evenings for some special events and the uh, lights were turned on in the building. So when we were looking at the lighting energy consumption, we were seeing some energy consumption even during the night, which was supposed to be controlled. So it could be, the reason could be malfunction of the systems um, controls because they were supposed to control the lighting to have like five percent electricity during the nights but it was a lot more it was like you know 20 30 percent um those were the um uh, those were some of the um things that we mentioned um that i had i want to ask the other panelists to see what kind of experience they have yeah i'd like to jump in on this um there's a, uh, uh, what we would call the zero flaw of energy modeling is that every energy model is wrong, no matter how detailed your inputs are and how correct they are. Um, that's sort of the number one rule of energy modeling. Um, and because of that, having a totally accurate model still may not be enough to show you exactly what your actual energy consumption is. And just remember, one of the main inputs of an energy model is your weather file. Your weather file is just your typical weather file. And if you're gonna compare your energy consumption from a typical weather file versus a actual weather file, you're gonna have, you're gonna be off quite a bit. Um, we can remedy that by using realistic weather data that you can pull from previous years and try to model to, um, to that, to try and link in that energy consumption. But, every single fine detail just um, adds more and more complexity on top of each other and, and it doesn't necessarily get you to that solely accurate complete energy story so um, i think uh, anyone who's attempting to do some energy modeling should always keep that in mind that every energy model is, is wrong and i think both mark and panos would agree with me on that one um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the decisions coming out of them are wrong, right? Um, the decisions coming out of them, uh, it's more down to your, your comparisons than anything else, uh, which 
is very useful. So I'll open it up to Mark and Hannes as well if they have stuff to add. I can, I can go next. I mean, uh, it, it really depends on the available information and troubleshooting time, right? And, and we are always constrained with a budget that we have to meet. But can you get close? Absolutely. Uh, at the same time, you know, you need time to fine tune all the inputs and make sure that this is exactly where the problem is. Now, to add to Colin's uh, uh, kind of like uncertainty about the weather, I would uh, throw two more factors in there and one is human behavior so you cannot really predict that and also uh, infiltration um, this is one parameter that is still a black bo black box to me um, but at the same time you know you just have to realize that there is always a level of uncertainty around that uh, you also have to kind of like make sure that you understand how the building operates based on on the design too. I would I would just give a ditto. Um, lots of lots of buildings can can misbehave after they've been handed over. Um, so something can start a certain way, but you could have a totally different approach with operation and management. Um, there, I think that there's one example I comes to mind for me as a we did a behavioral health building. Um, which had the benefit of being a, a 24 seven uh, operation building. So you really, uh, you set a certain threshold where you can't really go any higher than that. And um, the EUI did come out to be pretty comparable um, to what was intended. And I, I think it was just, um, you know, all of, all of the factors were uh, as predictable as they could be. And the, the operation was like, modeled for its maximum. And so the outcome uh, was close to it. Um, I would say that you would rather find out that your EUI is like one or two away than like 20 away. So there's there's definitely a, a threshold to, to being like enough and then maybe not enough. Okay, so I think we can move to the next question. Um, related to the previous question, what is precise accuracy necessary and when it is not? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think we really wanna be precise, but as uh, Colin showed in his graph where the target was showing, I think having high accuracy, just being around the main target in the center of target is important, um, especially during the early phases. When we start the uh, analysis, it's important to, you know, uh, to target around the middle, not to be far away. Um, so I think it is important to, and that's why I shared those um, benchmarking tools because they really uh, help us to see um, how the other buildings with similar internal lows, uh, similar, you know, weather condition perform with similar fun building function. So using those benchmarking tools really help us to get close to the middle, to the center of target, even though it's not highly accurate. Um, the other question, question for the panel, most AIA practices are small firms five employees or less. They won't have access to the Arabs and uh, Borough Happels of the world. What does an ideal building energy simulation workflow look like for them? Um, I have a small firm and, uh, um, you know, I started my practice to change this paradigm, honestly. Um, to make the uh, building performance simulation and analysis available for all the projects because I really care about climate change and I think it is very important and it should be more affordable and it should be done for all the projects, no matter how much the client pays. So I think we have to figure out some ways to make it more affordable and more streamlined and um, more used across all the, um, you know, all the architectural practices. Um, 
any of the panelists would like to comment about that? I, I would add uh, one, one point to this that I think um, can seem seem like it's impossible just looking at what we've discussed so far, but um, the the intent behind uh, Honeybee and Ladybug uh, really is open source. So the um, the information is is meant to be out there um, so that anyone anyone with a Rhino license can can do these things. Um, you know, going into like greater detail is always going to be, I think, a learning curve for anyone. Um, but if I was speaking to the the small firms of the world, um, I would say that we we all have have talked about how the the impact of doing this early is is really the greatest impact. And so, um, do you do you need a detailed HVAC model for your uh, you know single family residence? Maybe not. But um, could early energy modeling have uh, clued you into some uh, design intent? That was previously you know you were unaware of so if that's like the site approach um the massing of the of the project passive systems um those types of things i think on a on a smaller scale uh those are those are accessible for everyone yeah and i want to uh, that's a great point mark and i think um Ladybug Tools have started these tutorials, uh, which are available for purchase. They're very um, affordable. It's like um, uh, um, it's like twenty five dollars per month to have access to video tutorials uh, that have a step by step, a gradual, um, you know, learning uh, webinars. Um, which are very useful. So if you have anybody in your firm who's interested I, um, in this topic, I think they can start learning um, the tools and it's free and the webinars are affordable. I'd also like to piggyback on that about sort of what, what an ideal workflow would look like. I think I touched on that a little bit in my presentation. Um, the or portion of the presentation. The, the thing for small firms, obviously, is it's a huge time commitment to start doing an energy model, especially if you have it in, the, in mind that you need to have a wholly accurate uh, model that represents your building in totality. Um, however, some of the most insights we get in projects is by doing what we would call a shoebox model or, or a box model, concept model. Um, it doesn't really matter what your building is, you can still uh, get pertinent information out of doing box model within your climate. You know, trying to, you know, I think the easiest analysis to do right off the bat is something as sim simple as a single zone box model and looking at how different insulation values impact your load within a space, right? That's something that's, that's very easily achievable, right? Right from the get go on almost all of the software that were shown. Um, and um, the biggest challenge is actually just committing the time. That's really the first hurdle. Um, it, it takes someone the, and being able to, to say, okay, this new project that's just starting, we're gonna commit to doing our own internal envelope study in concepts before we even reached out even to a subconsultant maybe. Um, and that's just the first step and your first models might not be great, which is fine too. It's not a waste of time because it's an incremental link. It's an incremental increase in effectiveness as you go through. You learn based on your results. You learn um, what to do, what not to do, and it's and what um, and then you can also then consult with a sub consultant about what you've done and what the results are. And um, I believe it was a study from HKS. That someone can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they. They showed that the ROI of an energy model and the energy modeling time is essentially one month or two months, something of that nature, for the, for the whole project. And that's if you subconsult out to a firm to do it for you. So internally, that would be even lower. So realistically, just committing a little bit of time early in concept just to get your feet wet and committing to a single point analysis, that's really the best place to start from an ideal workflow point of view. Um, I would also like to go back to 
previous question, if I have time, just about the when is precise accuracy necessary, when it's not, because um, I think it links into this this commitment to say an envelope study, right? Um, if uh, when is really high precision, really high accuracy, really necessary, as an example, would be doing say a therm analysis on detail for a window assembly. You, you know, that requires a high level of precision and a high level of accuracy to make sure that you get the assembly you value of your window correct. Um, when is high precision not necessary? necessary? Well, if I have 10 different window types on a building with 10 different U values and 10 different SHGCs, depending on how that's, you know, depending on where I am in the stage of the project, it may be more it may be more beneficial to model a weighted average of all the window types as a single window across the entire building, rather than trying to be as detailed as possible, putting every window exactly where it's supposed to be. Um, I think that's a good example of when it is and when it isn't necessary, and that can be expanded upon um, for different elements within the building. Thank you so much, Colin. So I think, um... We have reached the end of the time frame that we had for this discussion. Um, uh, Bill, thank you so much for your comments. I think the one uh, question or comment you mentioned about Ibiza and Quebec, it's very important. Um, um, so I think the best thing to do is to have a follow-up email to discuss the further questions, address the further questions and discuss the uh, comments later. And thank you everyone for joining uh, uh, to this, this session um, um, and have a great day. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, bye. Thank you.